Hi, I'm Irving. Welcome to Cato and that bug guy. As we begin, the Green Hornet and Cato are racing to the dwelling of one Dr. Wiley, why we don't know yet. But the good doctor isn't answering his phone, and we find out the reason. No. No, absolutely not. I will not be a party to the scheme. And I told you what I'd do if you didn't. Yes, I'll go to the police. Professor Soon Dead Wiley heads out, leaving his associate Mary to wrap up some paperwork. Hello? Professor Wiley? No, I'm sorry, he isn't here. Who's calling, please? Never mind. A friend. Where can I reach a professor? It's a matter of life or death. But, well, he just left a few minutes ago. Find him. Get him back to his office. Tell him not to move. His life is in danger. We all know he's going to be too late, so let's see how it's done. <laughs> An armored car, subtle and undetectable. Mary runs out just as the armored car leaves and the Green Hornet and Cato arrive to try and save the professor. Later at Britt Reed's house, D.A. Scanlon asks, What the heck happened out there? And why were you there anyway? Reed says, Maybe this phone recording will explain. Hello? Mr. Reed? Speaking. Mr. Reed, I can't tell you who I am, but you must believe what I'm going to tell you. You must contact Professor Thomas Wiley at Metropolitan University immediately. Warn him that his life is in danger. He is going to be... Harriet? I can't tell you who I am, but he will. Just a minute, Mr. Reed. Yes? Mr. Eden wants you in the tangerine room. Coming. Professor Wiley's going to be murdered tonight. Hello? Hello? I don't know. There's not much to go on as far as locating her. All we know is her name's Harriet, she works for someone named Mr. Eden, and he has a place with something called the tangerine room. If only there was a way to narrow this down. No idea who the woman was? Only that her name was Harriet. He'll start by flying to Gotham City to investigate Dick Grayson's aunt. Why do you suppose she called you instead of the police? Or Wiley himself, for that matter. Wait a minute. That man's voice in the background said that she was wanted in the tangerine room? Good. That only took you 20 seconds. Now put the rest of it together. Come on, you can do it. Does that mean anything to you? Well, it could be the name of a restaurant, a nightclub, or a cocktail lounge. I've already checked that out. Drew a blank. But wait a minute, it could... Hey, that man's voice said that she was wanted by a Mr. Eden. Give the man a teddy bear. He got all three clues. Wait, he didn't get the Harriet one Britt Reed did. Sorry, no teddy bear for you. There's a, uh, a health club called uh, the Vale of Eden. It's run by Peter Eden. Between the two of them, it only took 44 seconds to do what the rest of us did in five. The cream of the crop in... What city is this anyway? They never say. Maybe the city's too embarrassed to admit they harbor these two. Britt pulls out a phone book and looks up a number. Yes, Dorothy, dear? There's a man on the phone, Mr. Eden. He wants to speak to Harriet, but he won't say who he is. And? Uh-huh. Well, he wants her home address and phone number. Really? Dude, even in 1967, we knew what stalking was, and that's what it sounds like you're doing. Really? Peter Eden speaking. May I be of assistance? I'm terribly sorry, sir. We can't give out that sort of information about our employees. We must protect them from... uh, Well, you understand. However, if you would like to leave your name and number, I'd be glad to give it to him. Well, that's not going to throw any suspicion on Harriet at all now, is it? What was he trying to accomplish? Just say, I'm Britt Reed and I'm doing a piece on your new place. Somebody told me she's really good and would be a good one to interview. While I'm at it, when's a good time to talk to you? That's called using your leverage. Now he's probably gotten Harriet killed. Totally oblivious to all that, he pays an after-hours visit to the spa. Smooth. They'll never know you were there. Did he suddenly become the green rhinoceros?
It's nice they left all the lights on just in case somebody drops by. Hold it. The lights were already on. Now you've gone and ruined the ambiance. Somebody told me I have to remember this isn't the Bruce Lee show. I disagree. Here it is. Harriet Dennis. 71 Harding Road. <laughs> the Black Beauty arrives just as they're stuffing her in the car and taking off. After them, Cato. We get a car chase that leaves us wondering why the Black Beauty doesn't have some kind of gadget that can disable a car thereafter, with cut-ins of Harriet struggling with the goon in the back seat. It's the Green Hornet! What has he done to that girl? Let's go. I'm a doctor. Let me help her. The next day, Miss Case discovers that Harriet used to work for the Sentinel on the switchboard, which may be why she called Britt instead of the police about Professor Wiley. He decides it's time for him and Miss Case to take a tour of the place. Yes, sir, Mr. Reed, this place is the greatest. It's really been a lifesaver. You know, I'm treasurer of the racetrack, and I handle millions of dollars every day, so there's lots of strain, there's nervous tension. And I come here two, three times a week, and I just get the knots and the kinks all worked out. There's nothing more soothing than the proper music. You ought to try it, Mr. Reed. What was that he said about the proper music? We uh, personalize it for each of our patrons. Come, let me show you our music room. They meet up with Dorothy and Miss Case just then. Now, as I was saying, we select the music to suit the overall personality and the psychological need of a given client. And how do you determine those things about a client so quickly? Varying it from time to time to accommodate the specific mood at treatment time. The music is piped in from here to the various rooms. What's this, Mr. Eden? Ah, that is what we call our dubbing machine. We use it to make any special tapes that we might need. It works in a... Dorothy, dear, we've left poor Mrs. Wilcox in the tub too long. Excuse us, will you? A dubbing machine is one that lets you add voiceover to a recording, such as music. A voiceover such as a subliminal command. I smell trouble. How did Miss Case behave? Fine. Me too. Something... Something amiss. Something amiss. Definitely something amiss. Better call Watner. Gotta get Watner. They step around to a two-way mirror to see what Reed and Miss Case are up to. What do you want that for? I don't know. Maybe I'll find out when I play it. Eden pops back in and says, why don't you take a treatment yourself right now and see what it's like? Reed says, I have to get back to the office, but he encourages Miss Case to try it. Nothing like throwing your good right-hand person into the lion's den without any warning. Casey isn't too keen on this idea, but she goes along anyway. As Britt is exiting, one of his many bimbos buttonholes him and he spends the next hour or so listening to her talk. He drops her off at Oliver's Fine Jewelry. Britt! I'll bet my last good shirt the Green Hornet was behind it. Behind what? You mean you haven't heard? No, I've been working on this speech. Heard about what? Oliver's. What about Oliver's? They just had a necklace stolen. Gosh, I never saw that coming. The famous Catherine necklace worth $250,000. Some dame heisted it. When it's 1967 and you're as old as Mike is, you can get away with saying something like that. What time was this? A few minutes after four this afternoon. But the strange part is, the dame had an appointment with Oliver and stole the necklace from under his nose right in his own office. Now Oliver says he can't remember a thing about it. Vanessa wasn't the only one who's been going to the spa. Matter of fact, he denies any such dame was ever in his office. If the clerk Hartley hadn't seen... Britt, now where'd he go to? He's gone home to change clothes, something with a little more green in it. No, he visits Vanessa. She insists she's been home all day, hasn't been to Oliver's in years, and hasn't seen him in months. 
Meanwhile, Miss Case has finished her treatment. Now I really must go. Miss Case. Aren't you forgetting something? Yes. How stupid of me. <laughs> that gun is as big as she is, and we all know what she's supposed to do with it. At Britt's house, he and Scanlon are talking about all the other prominent citizens who have been caught in criminal activities lately. None of them remembers a thing. Britt thinks he knows why. Thanks. <laughs> what, music? That's at normal speed. Now listen to what happens when I turn the speed down to where the tape is barely moving. If anybody's wondering, with a decent reel-to-reel -reel machine, you could do that. When you get the money, you will bring it to me. You will not remember. Professor Wiley, it turns out, was working on taking the idea of subliminal advertising, the kind where a frame goes by so fast you don't consciously see it, and applying it to the spoken word. Overlay it on the music, sped up enough, and the ear doesn't consciously catch it, but the mind does. Peter Eden took, well, stole actually, that idea and used it for nefarious purposes, and when the professor wouldn't join him, he killed him. You do remember you left Casey to undergo one of these treatments, right? Maybe have somebody round her up just to be safe. Miss Case, how was it at the Vale of Eden? Just fine. Never mind, there she is. Now, remember what you were just talking about. I'll bet he remembers now. Easy, Miss Casey, easy. What was I going to do? Where did I get that gun? Veo of Eden. You were doing what you were programmed to do. I don't remember anything. I used you as a guinea pig to see if that was really what he was doing. Whatever he's paying her isn't enough. If he did that to her deliberately, she needs to sue his stinger off. There's nothing Scanlon can do to shut Eden down because he's got no admissible evidence. The principals involved don't remember anything and the tape was stolen. So Britt Reed says the Green Hornet is going to have a business meeting with Peter Eden. And with that, we end part one. Wait, that's where we end part one? Not with Casey about to shoot Britt? This isn't a cliffhanger because there's no sense of urgency. The Green Hornet is going to have a talk with Eden, but it's still daytime, so we have a few hours to kill. He should spend that time kissing Casey's feet and begging her to forgive him. Try this. Miss Case, how was it at the Vale of Eden? Just fine. That's how you end part one of a two-parter. The same guy who produced Batman produced this show. Did he forget everything he learned about cliffhangers from that show? We keep finding newer and more creative ways to shoot ourselves in the foot. Maybe the Mike Axford character is our way of injecting ourselves into the story. Let's see if they can redeem themselves in part two. Until then. <laughs>